right. Hello, everyone. Am I out? No. Yes. No. Yeah, you are. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Hello again. All right. So here we are for part two. Wasn't that long ago? We saw all your fresh faces this morning. Now we're going to go in a little more deep dive uh, using all the tools we talked about this morning. Uh, the bottom there is where all our resources are. If you weren't here this morning, that's where you can get the files. I'm also on Slack. So. As well, uh, so, colleague here, Bill Smith, uh, professional service engineer, senior. I uh, used to work with Bill. We both started at Jamf at the same time on Pro Services, and I just recently transitioned to the strategic support team now. So if you weren't here, that's all we covered in part one. A lot of stuff basically goes over all the different commands we're going to use today and how to interact with the API. Turn it over to Bill here to give you a little introduction to what the API actually is. Alrighty. Finally, we get away from all those code snippets and we start talking about interacting with Jamf Pro right now. And uh, this is why we're here. This is the API, Application Programming Interface. Uh, it's a fancy term, API, it's just a fancy term for a layer that sits between uh, you and the database. I'm, I'm oversimplifying that, but that's pretty much what it is. Uh, what's important to know is that uh, the web GUI and the API both exist at the same layer. One you can interact with through a browser, the other you simply can interact with through command line. They can do the exact same things. Your privileges are the same between the two. All right, so uh, the one thing that you do want to know is that the API does you a favor. It keeps you from getting into the database. That's a good thing. Uh, when you're dealing with the API, you are actually dealing with what you're allowed to do, just as if you were working in the web browser. Uh, but the web browser is not going to let you do anything like change the database schema or drop a table or do catastrophic damage. And you're probably familiar with the uh, command line has no undo. So if you drop a table, you're going to have to restore from backup. So the API is actually there to help you do things uh, the correct way, the right way. Uh, kind of like what Apple does in uh, making us funnel through certain things in order to get certain things accomplished, like DEP. Now, uh, let's see here. Uh, there, there we go. Next one. So uh, next thing to know about the API is that it's a REST API. What is REST? Uh, REST is designed to pass along things, nouns, uh, as opposed to passing along instructions, verbs. Uh, to update a computer record, we actually just upload an XML file that represents, that's part of the representational state, a computer file that represents the change that we want instead of sending a command to the API saying, go change that thing. Those are the differences uh, between most of that. Uh, the XML that you see on the left, uh, that represents a user. This user is Martin Moose. Uh, the XML that you see on the right uh, represents the change that we want to make. You'll notice it's just a little subset of stuff. Now, uh, we want to change the real name of the user from Martin Moose to Marty Moose, for example. Uh, the user's short name is Moose. That's going to be our key. That's how we identify this is what we want to change. We're going to key off of M Moose. And then this is what we actually want to change. We want to move that Marty over into Martin. And that's how REST works. We're just replacing a piece of information. We let the API talk to the database and handle the change. All right. Uh, you've probably heard by now, if you haven't, uh, this is worth knowing. What we're showing you today is what we are going to be referring to going forward as the classic API. That's Jamf's term for this, the classic API, uh, the one that supports XML. Uh, the uh, other API, which you may have heard about, used to be called the Universal API. Universal is going to also be renamed, rebranded. That's all it is, is just a change in name to just Jamf Pro API. So I would say any time forward when you're, you're, making, you're having conversations, you're discussing with somebody 
Uh, try, to, try to say I am referring to Classic API or Jamf Pro API, and hopefully people will understand the difference of, of what you're talking about here. Um, so one thing to know about the Universal API, the Jamf Pro API, it's a work in progress today. Uh, it is not a complete work in progress. It is nowhere near done. Uh, while the uh, Jamf Pro API will support a new new features like token-based authentication, uh, the plan is not to include XML, which is what we're showing you today. Uh, it's only going to include JSON. Uh, Mac OS has no built-in support for supporting JSON, which means you're going to now have to bring some additional tools to do that work when the time comes. Uh, if that uh, concerns you, there's a feature request at the bottom of this slide. Uh, that feature request is basically saying, please, please, in the new Jamf Pro API, include XML support. Uh, something else uh, worth noting, uh, Jamf has taken an API-first development initiative. And what that means is any new feature that's going to be coming out that we're going to be adding, we're going to put it into the API first. It may show up in the GUI at the same time. It may not. But it will at least be something that's exposed to scripting and to automation. API first, followed by GUI, more than likely they'll be kind of side by side as they get released. Uh, practically everything that you can do in the GUI, you should be able to do in the API or pretty close. All right. Let's talk about the documentation. Uh, most of the information about the, uh, the structure of the API is already on your Jamf Pro server. Uh, to access the API, you'll just simply open up a web browser. At the end of your Jamf Pro URL, you'll just add slash API to the end of, uh, of the uh, URL. Uh, but this is not documentation in terms of how do you write a script or what REST is or um, anything like that. You need to bring that knowledge with you. That's, that's why you're here today. This is documentation that is a reference. Uh, think of it like a man page in Terminal. The man page tells you the commands you can do. It doesn't tell you how you can use them. Uh, one of the things to know about uh, anything with the API is uh, it does honor permissions, the same permissions that you would have uh, to log in to your Jamf Pro server, the exact same permissions. So if you have full administrator access and you use your credentials, your API can do everything that you can do. And uh, those permissions, does any, anybody remember the term CRUD from any of their uh, trainings? Create, read, update, delete. And that's exactly what the API can do. The names are different, but it's still all CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. All right. And then finally, uh, if you need more information about this, we do have developer documentation on our website. Uh, you can just go out to developer.jamf.com slash documentation. So there's a couple of things that I want to show you, especially when it comes to Safari here. Uh, first of all, uh, let's copy our URL. I've got Safari open, but I want to open up uh, Firefox. I'm going to paste in the URL. I'm going to add slash API to the end. Here's the documentation I've been talking about. We're going to cover everything that you see here in just a little bit. But uh, one of the things that you need to be aware of is you're probably going to want to look at some of this stuff in your browser. Uh, Firefox and Chrome natively support showing you formatted XML, which is great. Safari does not. And just because I'm more familiar with it, I'm going to show you actually what mine looks like. Oh, new categories. One thing that you're going to want to do if you are looking at XML in Safari, 
Notice there is no debug menu here. This is just a little setup that you can do to make this work as well. If we ever look at XML in Safari, if you open up uh, Preferences and you go all the way over to the Advanced tab, you'll see that there's a Show Develop menu in here. You're not going to do anything with this menu. You just need to turn it on. That's what allows Safari to actually read or show you pretty XML as opposed to a bunch of unformatted garbage. All right. Let's go back to API. Now, everything that you see in here, these are called endpoints. And an endpoint is basically a representation of all the types of objects that you can have in Jamf Pro. Uh, a computer's endpoint is basically the same thing as if you were clicking on the computer's button in the upper left-hand corner and looking at all of your stuff. Uh, you'll notice that there's nothing in here, really, that you can't see somewhere in the web GUI. So already you've got a good parallel for where things are at. Now, any time that you look at some of this stuff, I was talking about CRUD just a little bit ago. If I open up computers, you'll see that we get a whole bunch of stuff. Now, here we're starting to look at kind of the nodes, the XML part of an endpoint. So if every endpoint has a bunch of objects, like the computer's endpoint has a bunch of computer objects, a bunch of computer records, this is where it's going to all start. When I mentioned CRUD a while ago, CRUD is create. That would actually be the same thing here as post. There's a one-to-one -one relationship for, uh, for all of this. Put is update, so that's the U in CRUD. Get is read, that's the R. And then delete is logically named delete. That's the only thing they decided to, I guess, keep the same. Now, let's actually kind of look through some of this stuff. Uh, let's go categories. I like using categories to show off things because it's a really, really simple uh, endpoint that we can look at and not really get confused by it. If I click on categories and I want to try it out, it's going to prompt me for credentials. Your API has to have a name and a password. Again, you can use yours for testing. Eventually, you're going to want to create your own account just for the API to run. Uh, did we? Did you change it to? You have it yet? It's still reading. It's still reading. Right. Read okay. So we have a an account, and just for this, we have access to. You all will have access to this. Oh, Jeff Reed. Okay. API. Thank you. So we have an account called API Read, and that password. And this is something you can all use, but please don't use it until we actually say you can. That password is going to be jamf1234. So I'm going to log in just to give myself access. And here it comes back with the full list of categories. Now, this API reference can show you two different things. First, if you do a get for the entire endpoint, it will show you a list of records for that endpoint. So if I'm looking at the categories endpoint, I am looking at all the different category records that we have. And it's a very, very simple list. It's all in XML format. Uh, the second item is typically the size. How many objects am I showing you? And for those times when you're looking through other parts of Jamf and you're in the GUI, uh, I can't remember uh, all the different places, but there are some places that don't actually tell you how many things you're looking at. It's just so long. You could actually come and look for the same endpoint in the API, and you can see how many policies you've got, how many smart groups you've got, how many of these unnumbered things in the web GUI you've got here. Everything else is just going to be an XML representation of each of the objects. Again, categories are stupid simple. This is all there is to it. That's all that makes up a category. It's got an ID and it's got a name. This is also showing you the XML that you're going to need to upload later. If, for example, I wanted to change uh, demo video to like demo video 2 or test video, I want to change the name of it, 
this is the XML that I would use minus the ID. You can't change the ID. That's set by JAMP. You can leave that little piece out, but everything else, this is it. This is what you would give back through the API. So every time that uh, you see an example that we're getting ready to show you, if it looks like this, if it looks like this, it's still just an API object or a, a single XML object like you see here. Okay. that and whenever you're doing a, uh, a a service account one of the things you probably want to do there's a, a few different best practices here I like what Josh does uh, you would go into JSS settings that little cog wheel in the upper right hand corner when you log in you would go create a regular Jamf Pro user account you don't have to give it any more than just access to your objects so uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about in a minute, but what I'm getting at is you don't have to give it any more than read access if all you're going to use is it, do with it is read information from JAMP. You don't need to give it any access to your mobile devices if all you're going to do is change computers. You don't need to give it access to your packages and your categories if all you're going to do is just allow somebody to send a command to a device. Try to make your privileges as least privileged as possible. So, I'm going to actually log in and show you what we've got. I'm using the same API read account that I just used to log in to, Jamf, uh, to the API. So API dash read jamf one two three four. If you'd like to follow along, you're more than welcome. If you would also uh, like to use your own server, you're more than welcome to use that. Just you can you know be careful. <laughs> All right, let's get logged in here. Sorry, what was that? All right, over here on the board. Okay. All right. You'll notice uh, because we're using a read account, Josh also has this kind of locked down. But if I go into Jamf Pro user accounts and groups, I have my API read account. Same username that you're used to. There's nothing different about this. But as far as the privileges are concerned, what you should do... Now, in this case, it doesn't really make as much difference. Let's... There we go. Uh, everything's just going to be read, but uh, notice under Jamf Pro server settings, he's got absolutely no access. The Jamf Pro server settings are everything that you can get to under this cog wheel. Now, there are pieces of that that uh, you can change with the API, but for the most part, your scripts are not going to need to get into this section. Deny it access. Don't give it any kind of read or write capabilities. Same thing goes for server actions. Uh, these are the actions that you can actually click a button on to lock a device, wipe a device, send a remote command of some type. If all you're doing is looking up computer information, don't give access to these, ac uh, to these buttons. That account has all these privileges through the API just as if you were looking at it through the GUI. And of course, the rest of these are the apps. Your API will have no need to have any privileges for these apps. Therefore, if somebody gets your API account password, they still won't be able to do anything with it. Only give access under, under the uh, Jamf Pro server objects where you actually need to give access. All right. A uh, few more command line tools for you. Curl. This is, this is where the magic happens. This is the, where the rubber hits the road. How many cliches can I say about this? <laughs> curl is what makes you do stuff with the API through the command line. Uh, it's the command that will either send data to the server or it will receive data down from the server. Uh, in its most basic form, 
curl reads the content of the page that you point it to. So that, that could be an index.html uh, page, something like that, or it can be a, an XML file. Doesn't really matter. Curl can typically download it and display it for you. So what I want to do here, just to kind of give you an example, let's open up a new tab here. And this is the example that I actually have on the slides. api.twitter.com one slash help slash configuration which if I spell it correctly dot XML there should be a an XML file there if I've typed everything correctly oh I hate that there we go and there is basically it's an XML file that says go to this other place. This is deprecated. And to kind of show you what I was getting back uh, earlier, uh, I said, we're in Safari. We can read this. We can make it pretty. If I did not enable that debug menu, and then I reran that again, it comes back like that. So if you're ever going to be experimenting in Safari, go enable that debug menu so you can get pretty XML. Again, uh, Safari or uh, Chrome and Firefox support displaying this natively. Now, let's take that URL. I'm going to copy it. Let's go into Code Runner. I've got my URL. I want to add curl to the beginning of it. Again, I should be putting the full path to curl. It's USR bin. But I will forget, so please forgive me. Uh, but that right there. Should give me just about everything. Let's see what happens if I run it. Oh, I left something out here. Ooh, sorry. HTTPS, API to Twitter.com, XML. So doesn't like showing that here. Let me take that over to terminal. There we go. It's effectively showing the same showing me the same XML, just all one line, one line of string. This is actually how uh, Safari got it a while ago. It was Safari that was putting it into pretty format. Okay. So there will be times, uh, you might remember when I had to actually put in my name and password you're going to have to supply your name and password of your API account to curl whenever you try to read the API. And that's where this comes in. We're going to add a dash dash user option to it. So it's just curl dash dash user, or if you want to use the abbreviated, it's just dash u. If I go into Code Runner, I say dash dash user. Our account name is API dash read. I separate that with a colon. So name on the left, password on the right, jamf1234. Uh, Josh likes to do it this way, where he actually has the colon in between. Either one of those is fine. You'll, you might see us going back and forth. We each have different styles of putting username. Either of these should work just fine. But now I can curl, I can authenticate, and I can go to HTTPS. Let's paste in what I've already got here. Or actually, I need this URL. And in this case, I want to get that categories. Sources. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, there is one more thing here that I should show you before I keep going. And there we go. If I look at categories, yeah, I'm back here. Reverse scrolling, got to love it. If I try it out, it returns the XML. It gives me the XML that I need probably to use in the future. It's also showing me this right here, the JSS resource. This is the path that I would actually use in a browser. So for example, if I copy this, I open up a new tab and I paste. Now I'm going to get rid of that API, so I'm keeping just the 8443. Then if I copy JSS categories, and I just come back and I paste it at the end. This is the REST API at work. Let me blow it up where you can see what I've done here. Okay. And if I just hit return, it returns the XML. Same thing as if you were looking in the uh, resource documentation. So it's all driven by URL. The same thing happens also whenever I'm doing the curl. Uh, I have to have JSS resource. Not plural, singular. I always type plural, and I misspell it. And if I run it, it comes back with the URL in flat format. This is the actual, this is the true XML. Again, when we were looking at it in Safari, it made it pretty for you. But this is actually what it looks like under the hood. All right. Any questions about authenticating? This was, again, just to add the dash user, dash dash user, so that we could put our name and password in there and get something out of it. If we had not included that, we would have gotten an authentication message, an error. And going forward, you're also going to see a lot of stuff like this. Just so that you're familiar with it, uh, I'm going to hit a backslash and hit return. Uh, that backslash means I'm just basically splitting up this line so I can fit uh, the same long line on one page. Uh, the backslash just means it continues on to the next line. All right. Now, if your Jamf Pro server has chosen, or if your company has chosen to use Jamf Pro's uh, built-in self-signed certificate, uh, in other words, you don't have a third-party signed certificate, uh, then you're going to need to use what's called the insecure option here. And that's also abbreviated dash K. Insecure means that if you don't have a valid SSL certificate, if you open up your browser in Safari and your browser barks at you and says, oh, this is not a valid uh, site, beware. You can make sure that curl can connect to it still just by saying, I know, it's insecure, go ahead and allow that. If you can, try to get uh, GoDaddy some third-party certificate. Jamf highly recommends using a third-party uh, certificate, not using our built-in SSL. So Let's most of our examples are not going to show that. Let's encrypt is free. So works just fine with Jamf Pro. Absolutely. All right, so now let's talk about headers. This, we're adding a few things to the curl command. This is very, very, this is the most complex tool you're going to be using out of all of this stuff. Uh, there are two headers that we have. This is a little bit of additional information that we would send off to Jamf Pro, uh, to the API, along with our XML that we're going to be uploading. Uh, the first one that we're going to be talking about is uh, the accept header. Uh, the accept header is pretty much saying, hey, API, when I ask you for some information, this is what I will accept. And uh, in this case right here, let's see if I can use your... <sighs> That's so cool. <laughs> in the case right here, I'm saying I will only accept text X, uh, XML. You might see application slash XML. It should be text slash XML. They will both work. 
Um, if you decided that you wanted to instead uh, get JSON, like you're getting ready to practice, you do actually have to say application slash JSON. Text slash JSON does not work. But for the most part, XML is text. So use text. And this is the part that we're sending along here, just dash dash header. Notice that I've got that backslash saying I'm wrapping around down to the next item. So that's what happens whenever you say, I want to get something from you. But when you are submitting something up to, uh, up to the JF Pro API, that's a different header. That's content type. And the content type has the same value. It's still text XML. Here is what I'm giving you. Those will be the only two headers that you ever use with curl in the API, just those two. Except I'm reading content type. This is what I'm giving you. That's all there is to it. And then uh, there's a few more things here. We have to kind of all talk about them at the same time because we can't use them individually from each other. Uh, there's another option here that's called request. This is, again, the same thing as if you were doing CRUD. You're going to be doing put, post, delete, get. And what I'm going to do now is just kind of show you an idea here. Uh, in your resources folder, there is an item called uh, create category sh. Let's open that up. This is everything you need to do to make a new category. Uh, notice it's, uh, I've got this wrapping, I've got the backslashes at the end, so technically this is just one long line. I'm just doing it here to make it readable. I am passing along my username and password. I am passing along the header that says I'm getting ready to upload this content type, which is just XML. Um, I'm doing a post, which means create. Now, if I were to do a put, which means update, I would actually have to say I'm updating something, which I'm not doing. So that could error out. I have to say post, create. And then finally, this is the data. And I haven't talked about dash dash data, but this is it. This is the XML that I'm getting ready to upload. Remember, in the API resource do documentation I just showed you for categories, it was just a little snippet of stuff. Here's the name. Here's the ID. This is a category, that's it. I'm leaving out the ID part. All I have to do is submit the XML that says this is a category, here's its name, and right smack dab in the middle, here's its value. And let's just see what happens. I'm going to change this slightly. Older operating systems. Uh, right is open? I think so. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah sure All right. Uh, another reason I like BBEdit, just like Code Runner, I could take this and I can run it from inside the tool. Without, I don't have to go save it. I don't have to go open up terminal, drag the file in. I can just run it right here. Oh, boy. This is why we do demos live, folks. And it just submitted that. It just put it up there. You'll notice that it brings back an ID of 11. So that's the new category that it just created. Let's go see if we can see it. Categories are up here in the uh, resources. And you'll see I had old earlier, and I just created older operating systems. The way I know that its uh, ID is 11 is I can look at the URL, and it shows me right here. So it's, it's that fast. It's stupid fast to do anything with the API. All right. At this point, I give it back to Josh. So now we're going to start building our script. So as we talked earlier, come on. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, say something. Hello. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so we talked about earlier variables. Uh, so now we're going to start taking a lot of these, the usernames, the passwords, the 
URLs, putting those into variables just to make it easier as we go. So we're gonna start out, we're gonna create a script. We're gonna kind of use these over and over again here. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna copy these three variables here over into uh, Code Runner in this case. I'm actually gonna quit and relaunch it here. All right. So I'm gonna start out here, put our variables in there so we have them for later on. Um, as Bill mentioned earlier, we have two accounts, the API-read if you're doing gets, uh, the API-write will do read and write. Uh, usually, I would create a separate API account for every workflow or script I'm doing, so the permissions are unique to that script. However, in this case, I'm not going to be member different accounts for the different scripts we're going to be doing, so we're just going to have API read and API write. <laughs> if you just want to use write, that's fine. And no mischief. No mischief. <laughs> We I have backups. You. I have backups. <laughs> All right. So, cool. All right. So we have our variables there copied over. Now we're going to go ahead and we're gonna actually going to build our curl command to store that information into a variable. As I said earlier, I don't like to write anything to disk. Keep everything in memory during the script. So we're going to go ahead and make a variable called API data. In that data, in this case, we're going to go out to computer groups and get the contents of computer group one, which is all managed clients by default. Find our slide around here. There we go. All right. Actually, okay. All right. I'm going to start out. I'm just going to do the curl request separately just so we can see it. And then I'll put it into actual an API or a variable. So curl to right. You can never type when you're in front of a group, you know? <laughs> now, in this case, technically, I don't have to write get. It's implied, but I just, my best practice, I do that usually. Plus, it's easier to change them later on. Computer groups, ID, one. Now, I'd, some people do it differently. I choose to put the JSS resource in the actual Jamf URL, just so it's less to type in in the curl command. You could put that down there and just have the URL in there. Uh, on ones I make for customers, I usually even bet it in the curl command and do the opposite. But all right, so we have our curl command here. Go ahead and run it. We get all a list of all the computers in that group, along with criteria and everything else. So let's kind of put that into a variable here. Go like this. API data. So that's all, we're just gonna wrap it up into a variable, run it again. We don't actually see any output, which is fine. Now if I want to, I can go ahead and echo out. API data, run it again, and there it all is. Now it's not really pleasant to read that, so let's clean it up a little bit. I'm gonna pipe it over to XML lint, format it. Now, in this case, uh, earlier we were using XML lint against files, so it was just XML lint dash dash format and the file name. This time, since we're actually piping information into it, we have to include a dash at the end here. Do that. Now it's pretty. So you can see all our stuff there. Unfortunately, I just want computers, and at the very top here, we have our name, our ID, our site it's part of, criteria, all the stuff I really don't care about in this case. I just want to see the computers that are there. So we'll break it down a little bit more. 
And we'll use XPath in this case. And we'll go to computers, I don't know, sorry, computer group. Underscore computer group. And computers. And now I have just a list of the computers without the actual criteria that go to the top. It's just computers. And I can do the opposite as well if I wanted to just see criteria. Questions on going into a variable. All right. Too many remotes. <laughs> all right. It's not the fun part, arrays. That's where all the fun is. So <laughs> whenever we're doing things with the API, usually I want to pull some information down, then I want to put something back up, or I want to change something. So the best way to do that is with an array. And in this case, we're going to do an array to get all the device IDs for a computer group. Looks like a lot, but we went through all these commands, so hopefully most of it makes sense there. But we'll kind of walk through it here as well. So first off the bat, just our headers here. So we have our username, password, our header, because we're doing accept. We're just getting information. Our get and our endpoint. So we're going to computer group uh, ID 1, so manage clients again. Our XPath command there is just doing what we just did. I just want to see a subset of the computers that are in that smart group. We don't want to see the criteria. In this case, here's where you want to format it so we can actually use grep and awk to actually get the information. Because again, grep and awk go line by line. So we're going to format it. We're going to grep it to look for the IDs, find all the lines that have just the IDs. And then we're going to awk it and just get the information in between the IDs. All right. And we'll build this out step by step so you can see how that all works. We'll start with our command we had before. This time, we're going to go to go to group three. What do we have here? This is uh, my computer group called Delete Me. So <laughs> a few computers in there for deletion. But we want to narrow that down. So we'll go ahead and do XPath on this. Computer. Computers. Okay. So we're getting closer. Now we have just the computer we subset. Let's pretty that up. And let's see, you were all malformed. Pipe. Oh, thank you. We'll back up here then. <laughs> okay, so we have that. There we go. So now it's formatted. You can actually manipulate it now. So then I'll pipe it over to awk next. And let's see, user name awk. We're going to get just the ID numbers out of here. Okay, so that gives us the ID numbers, but we have another issue here. All that extra blank space in there from when we pretty it up. So that's where we want to do grep first before awk, just to get just the lines we want. So I'll come in here, and just before this line, go ahead and do our grep. And we just want to grep the ID tag. Now we have just our three computers there in the delete me smart or static group. So from there, now that we know the command works, we can put it into an array. So much like a variable, 
I'm going to call this device IDs. And usually a variable would be like this. So now it's in a variable. But that doesn't work for me. I want to loop through it. The only difference in the array is we really just add another set of parentheses around it. Now it's an array. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, now the benefit that gets me, you don't get any output there, but when I go ahead and actually echo out that array, see there's my three there, which is the same thing that would look like a variable. But the key here is if I go, and let's just change this. So array start at zero, not at one. Don't forget only zero. I can echo out each one individually. That now works for me when I loop through that, and I can execute commands on each of those device IDs. Questions? OK. Yep. <laughs> uh, stupid syntax question, but if you uh, leave the extra parentheses off, does it just store it as one string with the three values? Yes. Okay. Yep. So that's the one thing with bash. Um, go ahead and toss. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really do new lines well with variables. So um, you can do new lines if you do it kind of trickily. You can kind of trick it and do it, but this is just guaranteed it's going to work. It's going to be smooth. So if I was to try to go actually, and now if I go back here, and we'll just make it a variable. It's just one line. I have no way of breaking that up. Even though it was a different line in the actual XML that I was parsing, it doesn't really store that. So. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, oh, the dirty little secret. <laughs> <laughs> so all that's great. It's a lot of stuff we can do. We can actually replace three of those lines with one Perl command. This is the only time you will see either of us use Perl. <laughs> Perl is dead. Don't use it. No. <laughs> no, people who do some amazing things with Perl, we just don't program Perl. Uh, but you can replace three lines with this one line here, the bottom. So I go back here. We had the XML int, the grep, and the out command. All three of those replaced by one. All you have to do, and we keep this in our tool bag, because all you have to do is change the ID tags there for whatever you're trying to get out of there. And it will put it on a new line for each array. Works beautifully. The reason we call it our dirty little secret is because neither one of us have bothered to remember this command. Uh, we just go copy and paste it wherever we need it. and We just know this is what will work. Yeah, and don't ask us how it works. It just works. We, we don't even know how it works. <laughs> That's a go-to uh, command uh, with just changing the ID tag to like whichever one that you want to target. Yes. If we want names, we'll change that to actually uh, our brackets with name and then closing bracket as well, and it will grab just the information in between those at every occurrence in that file or variable. All right. So now that we have our array, we can actually loop through it and do something with it. So in this case, I'm going to delete those three computers. So please don't beat me to it. <laughs> you kind of messed the demo up. <laughs> um, all right. So yeah. OK. Go ahead and open up code runner. Oh, fix it out. All right. So we have our code runner here. We have our array up here. We'll make that an array again, actually, since it's a variable. All right, now below it here, I'm gonna go ahead and make our loop. So we're gonna do a for loop. If you don't understand this, that's okay. Just all this will be provided out and you can just manipulate it as need be. Um, that's how I started. I never formally learned code, it just over years of doing it, <laughs> so. All right, and just for, since we're going to delete something here, I'm just going to put an echo statement in there for logging purposes. It doesn't need to be there, but just my preference. So we're going to 
computer ID. So that I is also a variable in this case. So basically I is going through every iteration or element in that array or index. And that value that's stored is what I is. So we're going to put the I there for the computer ID number. And we're going to go ahead and run curl. User. User. And here's where I messed up my notes. So by default, I wanted to write accept. Because we're actually doing an action, it should actually be um, content type. This is kind of a tricky one, though, because I'm not actually providing any XML, so this would work with either one, but yeah. <laughs> I'll leave this except just to show you, but even though we're doing an action, uh, it's not, we're not actually providing any data, that data variable. It's kind of our trigger for using the content type. We're going to delete, and we'll specify our Jamf URL, computers, ID, and then we're going to specify the dollar sign I there for whatever the ID number is of that computer. And then we'll close out our loop here. All right, so there's our loop. It's going to go through and delete those computers, 538295. Let's pull those up here. So we got delete me. So there's those three. They're showing up right now. Go ahead and I run this. All right, gives us our feedback there. Let's make sure I'm okay. Bounce back. Nothing there, so it deletes it. So use this a lot uh, for even like education, especially in the summer they're cleaning up computers from the previously graduating class. If you have a CSV or a smart group form, it takes a lot work out of than just going through and trying to delete them all. So. Questions on the array in the loop? Cool. All right. All right. All right. So now, basically, at that point, you have a script that works. So just putting it all together, that's your script. That's just those three sections. That's it. This thing you can reuse over and over for whatever you want. I like this one because it's easy for customers because you can create a static or device or mobile or sorry static or smart group, have your device in there that you want to do something to, and then in the bottom section there, what are we doing against it? In this case, we're deleting, but that could be uh, a mobile device command. It could be an update of inventory, an asset tag, whatever. So it's an easy framework to modify for future use, which we will do later on. Actually, we'll do it right now. All right, we're going to repurpose that code. <laughs> I was thinking build that spot first, but nope. All right, so we're going to go ahead and repurpose that code now. <laughs> so we have our same variables as before. We're going to add a few more. In this case, we are going to do mobile device command. Uh, big one in what we're going to build here in the summer is EDU especially. Stu if you have a one-to-one -one program, students don't always like to return their devices at the end of the year. You have to put them in loss mode. That's kind of a pain to go one by one and do loss mode, right? Now we can take a static group or mobile device group and do that for you. So we're going to add a few variables because of this. First of all, what our device group is makes it easily modifiable in the future for use instead of identifying it in the script. What our message is going to be for loss mode and what the phone number is going to be. All right. And all right, so we've got our device IDs here. This is what we had before. We're going to do a few little changes. So the first thing we're going to do, swap that out with the actual endpoints we're going to hit and where the elements are in the XML. And we'll go ahead and update our device ID quick. We'll array here. I'm going to add in those variables as well. Four. 
just cannot type. All right. Go ahead and update our actual endpoints here. So instead of computer groups, we're going to go to mobile device groups. And instead of identifying the three here, I'm just going to use this variable. And we're going to also update this here to mobile device group and mobile device. All right, everything else is the same in that array. So if I run that, let's cut this out for a second here. I'm gonna echo out device. Sure, now it wants to autocomplete. All right, run that. We got two devices in there we're gonna do our loss mode against. deck here. Yep, did that. All right. So now this one, last one delete, we didn't actually include any kind of XML data because we're just deleting. There's an endpoint for that. It makes it really simple and clean. This one, we have to provide that XML data. So in this case, we have that payload already kind of defined here. Again, usually this would be in a flat format, but for simplicity of reading, we're just going to keep it pretty. But this is the basic setup for it. So you have your mobile device command is your initial tags. Under general here, we have what our command is. In this case, enable loss mode. Specify our loss mode message, phone number. Then underneath the mobile device tags, we're gonna specify which devices. Now in this case, just the way I have the script set up for easily repurposing it, it is gonna do a new curl command for every one of these. I could also use that curl, I guess that loop to add in multiple devices to the same payload. If I had a lot, I would. <laughs> For two, I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, if I had multiple devices, I would do that. And let's just copy that over quick. I don't feel like uh, fat fingering this block. I'm just going to I'm going to put that there for right now. We're going to move that, but we're going to put it there for now. All right. Okay, so now we have to actually update our loop. So first thing I want to do, go update my notes. Maybe. All right. So we're going to we got the XML template we want to put in there. So we're going to move everything down a little bit. That's going to be where our XML template's going to live inside the loop. We're going to update our echo statement. We're not doing computers anymore. We're enabling loss mode, so we're going to send that command out. Update our curl statement as well. So here's where we're now using content type for our text XML because we're actually going to update or send a message. In this case, we're doing post, and then we're including our XML data there as a variable. Then we have our endpoint as well. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll move this little template down. Go ahead and update our echo statement. All right, change this to content type. And then do our post. And we're also going to do our data, which is just gonna be our XML uh, data variable. All right, and we'll 
update our endpoint we're going to hit. So we're going to hit uh, mobile devices, mobile device commands this time. Okay, mobile device. Okay. Command. Enable loss mode. All right. So this is what it all looks like. So we got our XML template in there. And what it's going to do is every time we loop through, it's going to input our message in there, our phone. And then the key thing is right here. We're going to replace that with a device ID, whatever one we actually want to put into loss mode. All right. Fingers crossed. It works. That took <laughs> half a day yesterday to get working on this database. <laughs> These are all dummy devices. All right, so. <laughs> there are people out there now going, what? <laughs> yeah, none of these devices are actually legit. One second here. Um, going to class 2018. We view them. If I pick on one of these, we'll go on Brett's iPad. Management. And it's failed, but it did trigger. So. So with the, uh, the setup you've got, how do you know we're getting the devices that are actually lost as opposed to all the devices that are in your database? So I'm scoping it to an actual group, a smart group or a static group. So, so you have to do that work ahead of time. put the lost devices in that group. Yeah. I just used one I had created temporarily and oh, just okay. called it class 2018. But you would go ahead and actually do like maybe devices that haven't checked in X number of days or if you just know certain students. Oh, like a trigger or something. Yeah. You have to still create that static group or smart group for those devices, then you can issue it out. Okay. Any other questions? I think uh, it was already talked about a little bit, but can you reiterate the difference between post and put? Or, uh, yeah, post and put? Post is and put. It? Yeah, post is create and put is update. Yeah. So change. Modify. Okay, so if you're creating and updating at the same time, do you? Uh, you can only send one of those um, one of those commands at a time with the curl command. Yeah. You can't say put and post. Uh, you can't say like create that. this category and then put this in it. That'd be two different commands. Two different wrong. commands. Yep. Okay. All right, so that's one mobile device command we did. Computers, there really isn't that many. There's a few you can run. Uh, this is going to grow. Apple is moving more and more towards the MDM side of things and doing less with actual packages and plists. So expect this list to grow over the next few years especially. Now, on the other hand, iOS, there's a lot. iOS is MDM only. But all this stuff you can do via the API. The ones with the asterisks, that means usually most cases that you supervised are potentially DP enrolled. So. I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, did you have a question? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Rain is a little bit slow. You have this function where you have actions when you have an uh, inventory runner in Gemf Pro. Uh, say, these devices, uh, I have an advanced inventory of that, and then there's this action button, and then I have this update. Right. Yep. More or less like, is this the GUI for something you're doing yourself in the same background with an API? Thing. Yep. Okay. Same it's, process. It's the exact same thing. Uh, and again, anything you can do in the GUI, or in the API, you should be able to do in the GUI. Uh, one is just a, a visual button. The other is just a command to do, to do the exact same thing. Right. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, advanced searches. And I've left this one purposely blank because I'm going to kind of walk through it in just a little bit. Uh, the API does have a limitation, though, in that it can only return, it can only do two things. Uh, as, as far as giving you information, it can only return a list of items in an, in an endpoint. So in other words, uh, my endpoint is categories. It can only return a list of categories. 
or it can only change one thing at a time. Everything is a single curl command. If I want to change all of my categories to have uh, uh, API at the end of it, all my, I have to run that number of curl commands for each category. It, uh, the API cannot run a MySQL query such as find all computers without asset tags and give me the serial numbers. It, it can't do that. However, Jamf Pro can do that. Uh, that's what advanced computer searches and advanced mobile device searches are. And we can use the API to create those advanced searches. And then we can run them, and then we can return the results from them. Uh, this is one of the more complex tasks that you're ever going to do with the API. And uh, because we're going to be running three different curl commands to make this one thing happen for us, to do all of that work. And uh, we're going to take advantage of XML Lint and awk to help us out to, to format our XML and filter our results. So see how this goes. In Code Runner, I'm going to open up, uh, it's in your resources, uh, the advanced computer search script. And it's several things in here. I'm just going to kind of walk through it just a little bit. So at the very top, we have our variables that say, this is how I log in. This is where I'm going. This is my server. This next section right here, this is the XML that I need to upload to create the same thing as if I were going to go into advanced computer searches and create a search. In this case, uh, the advanced computer search, the name is going to be mobile devices with no asset tags. That's what I'm looking for. Show me all devices without the asset tags. And I'm adding a variable to the end of it, uh, which is the date. The reason I'm doing that is because when I upload this, I don't want it to conflict with something else that might already be there. And I'm also going to be deleting this, too. I want to make sure that I'm not conflicting. So the date is probably the easiest way to make sure that there is no conflict with any other names of the, smart, of the, uh, of the searches. And if you were to actually look at this in a, a search, my fields that I would be adding would be asset tag. Show me the asset tag. And then uh, my asset tag and serial number. Those are the two things that I really want to get back. I put this XML in a pretty format inside the script so I can read it. I could have just as easily left it flat, but this is so that I can edit this later on for something else. <coughs> and actually, I don't need this command anymore. That's old. All right, so there's, uh, again, three things that have to happen. I need to create this advanced computer search. So what I'm going to try to do here is, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, I am just going to say, oh, wait, not that. Search ID, run search. Let's do it right here. I'm just going to stop it right there. I'm adding exit zero in the middle of my script. Go down, do all this stuff, stop. And that way I can keep the rest of my script. I can just test this little bit. And I think I've got everything right. Let's give it a shot and let's run it. Oh, for crying out loud. Rubber chicken is failing me today. API right. You're not echoing anything. Oh, sorry? You're not echoing anything? I'm not. I'm not. Actually, you're right. Let's go see if anything happened in here. Nope, it didn't. I would have gotten some feedback back. That's why I noticed that it's, it's not correct yet. Uh, you think so? Okay. Let's do that. Hey, it picks me right back up. I love it. Let's see if I can get this to go again. Click run. It says it succeeded, but I don't trust that. Yeah. 
All right, so that part of the demo is not working. Let's see if I can get the rest of it to work then. What that should have done was it should have put in an advanced computer search just as if I had clicked new and I had uh, given it a name and I said, go find me all computers without asset tags. Should have created that. Uh, the ID zero means make a new one, give it an ID of the next one available. Oh, okay. So sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. Okay. Anyway, uh, after it creates it, the next thing I have to do is actually run it. Oh, here's the create search right there. Uh, whenever I run it, I'm going to get back some information and it's going to be a string of XML. That string of XML is actually going to contain my ID number, so the unique ID of that. That's going to come in later, because uh, come in handy later, because I'm going to need to delete this. I don't want it to stick around. But in a little bit, um, I say right here, run the search, and then put it all back into this computer's list. And then once it's in that computer list, I can do the very last thing, which is, all right, now that I've got my results, I want you to delete that temporary computer search. Let's see if the whole thing works here. Parse error. Ah, end of data in tag HTML line one. Where are you? There you are. Somewhere I've left something out. This is what happens when you end up st adding stuff late at night. <laughs> All right. I'll try to get that fixed, and I'll put it back in the resources. But again, what it should do is give you that ability, instead of having to recurse through all of your information and say, give me the serial number of this. Now give me the serial number of that. Then give me the serial number of this. Doing the advanced computer searches, doing the advanced mobile device searches, they are the same thing practically as running MySQL queries. You get all that functionality of being able to glom things together and get a very complex search and return the results quickly. So if I skip the first part, oh. mm -hmm. make it manually, I'm and go from there. What do you mean? You can always use the GUI. In fact, uh, if you already know what the ID is, if you create something, if you have, if you have a permanent uh, search, you can always call that. I just like the idea of being able to on the fly create it, get my results, get rid of it, here's my stuff. But if it's something you're going to use again and again on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, do what he says and yeah. create it. And if, if you're going, again and again. exactly, if it's something you're going to use again and again, yeah, definitely call that. But if it's something that you will not be using, but your script will, just let your script recreate it and do it. But if you normally go into it yourself and you look at it as a human, then do that. All right. And we've got just two minutes left. We were going to also uh, cover, I think, troubleshooting next. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go through this really quick here. Uh, <laughs> really quick. All right. Troubleshooting the API. Whenever you get an error, first thing, read the error message. So many times we actually look at it and say, oh, it's an error. Crap, what's not working? Read it. Uh, so in this one, what's the error? What's wrong with it? Hey. Duplicate name, yes. So that's right there, duplicate name. Yeah, it, there it is. So we know that somewhere along, in this case, this is from actually creating a duplicate category. They already had a category with that same name. So now we can go look. Oh, we already have one named that. Okay, let's try something different. Another one. What's wrong with this one? Bad request. Yeah. Bad request, but why? Yeah, device doesn't support it. Device does not support that feature. So in this case, it's a mobile device command to actually restart the iOS device. But this device, either not supervised or for whatever reason, does not support it. If you can't read those pages, that's just HTML. You can copy it to a text file or an HTML file, open up in Safari, Firefox, whatever. A little easier to pick things out. HTTP status codes. A lot of details and presenter notes around these. So when you get the slide decks, which will all be on the PSU Mechanics Conference site, you can look at them all. 
but it goes through all those and what the common cases are for them. Yeah, just skip to the end okay. of that. So yeah, if you want to get them, there's a way to get the codes out to and actually store it to a result. That's all in here. Along with some really cool logging, we're at three minutes. Here's the MUT. Use it. Mike Levnick wrote it. Jeff Migrate from Policies. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, any other questions? Yeah, sure. We can just, they'll let us go back. Yeah. The this one? Yep. So, yeah, this is if you want to migrate uh, policies or objects between JSS environments, test and prod, this is a great way to do it via the API. You can pick what policies you want, even selectively individual ones or groups of them, and migrate them over.